Thank you for joining me today at Coffee With. We're located at the Highway 61 Coffee House on Washington Street. And as always, we want to say a special thank you to Daniel and Leslie for welcoming us. And we usually come in and just kind of take over the coffee shop, which is what we've done again today. My guest today is Representative Alex Monsoor, a very familiar face to us all. And thank you for joining me today. I know you've thank got you. a lot going on. We're just hours away from the crest, and I know you're very busy. But we'll get to the flood. We always end up talking about the, whoever I talk to. We always end up talking about the flood. So let I want to talk about you. Now you and I share something in common. Do you know Do you know what that is? Um, I'm sure you're going to tell me. We're both from Louisiana. Ah. Yeah. What part of Louisiana are you from? Well, I was born in South Louisiana, grew up in North Louisiana, but ended up in New Orleans, Mandeville, mm -hmm. that before I moved here. Mm -hmm. But I like Vicksburg. You've been here a lot longer. How long have you been in Vicksburg? Uh, next year will be 30 years. 30 years. So, yes. I mean, really, so we can start yeah. counting that. Yeah, we're home. We're home. We're home. Okay. So, tell me about yourself, Alex. You're married. You have children. You have dogs, yeah. cats, horses. Uh, married, What's the deal? Uh, married to Amanda Monsoor. Got two children, Zane and Kennedy. Uh, they go to uh, St. Francis. Uh, both of them on the honor roll. Excellent. Uh, that makes mom and dad happy. Well, yeah, and we have to do a lot of studying when they get home. Yeah. Uh, make sure they got their lessons there. They don't like to do them, but we make them do them. <laughs> so, and, that, and that's a key thing with our children today. So, um, and I have a little dog, uh, Bella. And uh, it's a great Dane. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not a great Dane. What no. is it? It's a little Yorkie. Okay. But. Uh, but uh, Yorkies think they're great Danes. Yes, they do. And great Danes, interestingly, think they're lap dogs like. Yorkies really should be. Yeah, but you wouldn't want one of them jumping in your lap. So, no, uh, but they'll try to sit in your lap. They will. Right. Okay, so um, you have been the representative for District 54. Um, this is your first term. That's right. About to wind up your first term. Four years. And we're hoping you're going to run for re-election. Yes, I am running again. Excellent. We're happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, and what, now I know that takes up a lot of your time, but not all of your time. So in the, the non-political part of your life, what do you do? I am an insurance agent and I also hold a real estate license here and um, prior to running I was a, a business owner. Uh, unfortunately uh, it was very expensive to run. I sold my business back then. Uh, it was a very good business. I was in just about every industrial location here in the vending business. Uh, I knew just about everybody in the industry out there mm -hmm. uh, and I think that had a lot to do with the way uh, the election turned out. We, uh, I was out there working with them uh, from Laterno to Batesville to uh, just everywhere and uh, had a very good working relationship with our industry out there and knew what it was about to get out there and work and get out there and grind it out. Had a payroll, had workers and so you know I had an understanding of what it was for everybody to get out there and have to pay taxes, pay payroll taxes, make notes on everything and uh, so I'm really involved in what it is for these small businesses to have to make it. Um, I was just in D.C. the other day uh, helping out on this card swipe deal to try to help get it reduced just a little bit. Um, tell us tell uh, us a little bit about that. The card swipe people know. deal is uh, what it is, this banking reform bill. I'm really not so much for the banking reform bill mm -hmm. that they had because it was, it was a massive bill with a lot of regulation in it. But there was an amendment put in the bill on the card swipe deal. Uh, the businesses now pay on average about... 39 to 44 cents every time they use a debit card. And uh, whether it's a small item, big item, uh, you, sometimes they can go in there and buy a cup of coffee and they wind up paying 39 cents, 44 cents on a debit fee. And what we're doing is in the amendment is, is, is saying, look, we want you to reduce the debit fee down to 12 cents. Because on average it costs them about four cents to process it and to, to do it. And we're just saying we don't want you to make, not make money off of it. We just don't want it to take so much money off of it. So, and because what it does is it helps the small business right, absolutely. in reducing their fee because when they're selling a 50-cent cup of coffee or 75-cent cup of coffee, when you talk about 39 cents to 44 cents of that fee going out, they might as well give it away. Well, it'll drive up the cost of the cup of right. coffee. Right. And then what it does <clears> is <throat> it allows the small business person to either reinvest in uh, their business or employ somebody because when you start taking that and putting it in transaction after transaction after transaction, we what we did, we found out that at the end of the year on some businesses, it was upwards of forty to $60,000 worth of fee transactions just on debit cards. Oh my goodness. And what we said was, 
Just let them have a break. We want you to make money, but we don't want you to actually have to do it because uh, what they have to do, it has to trickle down to the customer. Right. Raising up on the prices. So I'm in it to help <clears throat> the small business owner and help the customer at the same time. Those kind of things that we do in legislation are the things that can say, I'm not about the regulation part. I'm all for the business and every business making money. I'm just saying there's certain things we can do to help out, especially in the times we're in right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the economy is just, and the economy is the way it is because of bad policy mm -hmm. in the way we're going right now, in the way we have to change things in Washington, D.C. And, you know, but there are some things we can do in government to make it better for your customer and make it better for the business owner at the same time. What made you decide to run for representative? Well, as a youngster, I can remember back in the day, a lot of people didn't like Gerald Ford, but, um, you know, I, I got really involved in politics back then, and um, I always just was a political junkie, and I just happened to be a conservative political junkie. And back then, I just got involved in it, and then it worked its way into it, and then locally, I uh, became uh, the uh, chairman of the local Republican Party here, and just decided that I would do it, and I got involved in it. And it seemed like I got involved in the, the parts that just, it never paid anything, but I always did it because it was just community-based. And, you know, and I helped out, and I said, look, you know, we've got to try to get this place to uh, pick it up. Because, you know, I love Vicksburg. And we are sitting in a location where I think Vicksburg is in the top three locations in the state of Mississippi. Yes. Uh, we've got this, uh, the interstate, the river, the rail. Uh, and we've always heard, and I grew up here playing softball, I grew up here with everybody here, and one word I've always said is, everybody said we got the most potential in the state of Mississippi. And I can tell you this from sitting in the legislature. Every state representative over there fears Vicksburg because they know if we ever take that next step that this will be where everything grows from right here. Yeah, we've got the perfect geography. It's like the perfect storm. That's right. We're central. We've got all this transportation coming through here. We've got the river. That's right. Now, let me tell you, <clears throat> uh, just yesterday we had a uh, ruling come down from three uh, judges that uh, we're going to run in our current district. Excellent. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to go out there and run. And the Democrat leadership of the House uh, has held us down for quite a while now. How how long is how long have the Democrats forever? <laughs> we've we've never had control. The okay. Republicans have never had control, and uh, we're now primed to take control of the House. And what that's going to do is now let me let me tell you what what how it hurt us. Uh, my four years, I went in, and the Democrat leadership of the House. Just to give you a, a reference, the Senate, over in the Senate, uh, you had uh, shared chairman shared chairmanship of the committees in the Senate of Republicans and Democrats. In the House of Representatives, when I walked in those doors, not one Republican was a chairman of any committee really? in the House. 122 <clears throat> state representatives, not one Republican was a chairman of any committee. Now that is powerful because what that is, that means that Vicksburg did not have a chairman of any, of, committee. Of any committee representing anything so I didn't have the power to pull anything this way. Mm -hmm. Now we're primed to go in and I will be a chairman of a select committee and have the power to pull things now. That is the powerful thing of what you do. So that can match up our geography with That's correct. a lot That's of correct. other opportunities. That's correct. And I have positioned myself well with the Republican Party and we're, we're set to go now and this is what we're working for. And I'm telling you, Vicksburg is, it is a prime location. I have always said this. We need to do things for our families here. We don't have the things here that are good for, uh, right now, for families to do. The one thing we'd have to do in our industry, we've got to attract industry. But when you look at industry, industry looks and sees what it is to bring industry here. But at the same time, they want to see what it is to bring their employees here for their thing to do. A lot of times we get people to move here. But, and work here, but they live elsewhere, like Clinton and over in Madison and stuff. I don't want them to do that. What I want them to do is I want them to move here to Vicksburg, Mississippi. I want them to build a house here. I want them to buy their cars here. I want them to shop here, get that tax base here. I don't want them to raise taxes here. 
I want them to spend their money here and let's get that tax base spending here. And the way you do that is you build this community up by building up big ball fields, by building up um, bowling alleys, by building up um, our school water system. parks, school systems. But when you start building these things like that, it's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. That's where they did it in Madison. That's where we need to do it in Vicksburg. Sure. There's no reason why Vicksburg, Mississippi should not be what Madison, Mississippi is or any other place. The only thing that's stopping us is, is we just haven't had the leadership at the state level to bring it here. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have that now. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's coming. We, we have to have our people in the right spot to say, okay, now it's our time. Our Senator Hobson is um, the head of some committees. That's right. That I think that gives us really unlimited potential, That's unlimited right. opportunities. And with both the House and the Senate working together, and then, you know, you have a Republican governor, Republican House, and Republican Senate, and then we're all working and pulling in the same direction. That is the key to it. Mm -hmm. When you have everybody pulling in the same direction, that is going to help out Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, Vicksburg is sitting on a powder keg, and we just need to light the fuse on it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's so exciting to me right now, is that it, it, it just seems to be it's our turn now. Mm -hmm. And we're fixing to cross that threshold and do it now. So that's what's exciting to me. That is very exciting. You've got me all excited. I'm now, telling you, I'm Alex. pumped. I am pumped and ready to go with it. So I have just been waiting for this to happen. But for us to walk into those chambers four years ago, and I sat down with Billy McCoy and I walked in his office and I told him I wanted to work in a bipartisan way. But it lasted about two weeks. And not one chairmanship went to a Republican. And it got so partisan towards the Democrat side. And the fight was on from that point. And it just, it's been that way for four years. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, through the things we did, standing our ground, and doing the things we did, and Governor Barber's been great. Um, his leadership has been fantastic. Uh, a lot of people uh, fight him on certain things, but, you know, I've always uh, asked him to tell me about certain things and decisions we made. And uh, if you just talk to him and listen to what he's got to say, he'll lead you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. so. Now, Alex, tell me something. When you, um, when there's a new bill that's coming up, and like you said about the card swipe, that there were a lot of things buried in it, which we always hear about it being a non-political person. Um, when you get those, do you, I mean, do you have to sit and read through all that, or do you have people that brief you on that, or what are the just the pragmatic parts of when you receive a bill, deciding whether or not you're going to vote for it or against it? Well, it's, 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 that's kind of a two-fold question. Number one, what, a lot of times what they do with us, and when you don't have uh, anybody sitting uh, on these uh, committee chairs, a lot of times what they do is the leadership will, like, for instance, my first uh, session. Uh, two weeks into it, I get into my desk one day, and we've got an education bill sitting on my desk. We're going to vote on it in two hours. It's uh, 365 pages long. All right, well, nobody knew it. We just, it was there. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that you can vote on a bill, but they had forced in $46 million more than what we agreed to appropriate into the bill. Well, I, had, I voted no on it because I'm not going to vote on a bill like that. Uh, you know, we just, if anybody votes on a bill like that, uh, there's something wrong with it because, and, and the biggest fear of a vote, uh, you throw an education bill out there, you're going to lose a lot, of, a lot of people because they're scared to vote no on the education bill because the newspaper is going to say, come out and say Alex Monster voted no on education, he hates teachers or whatever. That's not what the case is. The case is, is that I'm going to vote on an education bill, but it's going to be the last education bill that you'll see in the, in the uh, correct appropriated money, what we've got to appropriate for that and what's supposed to be in that bill and the best deal that I can work out at the end of the, end of the session because we have to see what we have for money to spend and when, we, when we're spending $5.2 billion, we have to know what we have to allocate at the end of the year, you know, and what that is to, to spend everywhere. Mm -hmm. And how can you know that two weeks into the session when we don't even have the numbers in till March? So, you know, that, and then, yeah, when you ask that question, do we read the bills? We're supposed to. And if but we if don't... But if you have a 365-page document and you're mm -hmm. voting in two hours, that's not even possible. Well, no, it's not, but we're supposed to. So... But everybody is assigned to a committee. You're on a committee. You might not be the chairman of a committee. But, uh, and we all get together before the session and we say, okay, listen, when these bills come out in your committee, let us know. We're assigned on there. We, we assign certain people 
and they say, look, if you've got a bad bill coming out of a committee, let us know. We don't need to vote for that bill. Uh, and, and we will. We go into committees, and, and, and we know if there's a bad bill coming out. And, but a lot of times, they'll shoot a bill out on us and surprise us with it, and we don't know. So sometimes we have warnings, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. so. Well, are you ready to talk about the flood? Yeah. Okay. Well, I know that you and Senator Hobson um, really were the forerunners in, tell me about that. There's no point in me talking about it. I'd rather hear you talk about it. Well, what I, uh, I called Senator Hobson uh, several weeks back. And I told him, I said, you know, being from Louisiana, I pay a lot of attention to what happens in Louisiana. And uh, Katrina was a, a disaster. We respect the water. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so I, I called him several weeks back, and I told him, I said, uh, look, Briggs, I said, I think we need a call, and uh, let's talk to Mima, get a hold of Mike Womack, and uh, let's do this thing because we need to be prepared. Because, you know, I knew it was coming. We all knew it was coming. And uh, Briggs and I got on the phone. We went, I went to Senator Hobson's office, and we called uh, Mima, FEMA, and, um, and, and the governor's office. The lieutenant governor got on the phone with us, and we actually were the uh, first ones to call, Senator. And then uh, even uh, uh, Representative Flags was at the office in the meeting, too. And um, we all got together, and we called, and we got everything worked out. And we wanted to make sure that we were on the same page to let everybody know ahead of time what was going on. Make sure we were going to have the toll-free numbers set up. We wanted to find out about, you know, what we were going to do for, you know, living assistance and everything else. And that's when we knew we were ahead of the program on this thing here because I didn't want us to be caught up in a situation like they were down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, and, and I've been to numerous meetings with the mayor. I wanted to stay on top of that on the south end of town, north, north end of town. I mean, I just wanted to know. And um, so I feel like we've done a good job here. And, and I've told everybody, I, of course, if anybody's got my card, they know my cell phone's numbers, on, and it has been ringing off the wall. But that's my job. So, that's right. you know, yeah. uh, and uh, I've had people want me to stop the water, open the highways, and turn on electricity. And I hadn't been able to do that, but at least I can call and try to find out why, you know, somebody's electricity's off and everything. And we know why, because the lines are hanging low to the water, and, you know, people, some people get out there when they're not supposed to. We don't want them to get electrocuted. So. Um, but, you know, we've been on top of it, and so far, and the good thing about it is nobody's gotten killed. We've been able to keep people out of harm's way and keep them informed. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is the governor's done his job. We are uh, on every federal program out there we can possibly mm -hmm. be on, and the money's going to be there to help people in recovery. And I can say we've, uh, in the state of Mississippi, as always, Governor Barber's done a good job, and we are ready to go with it. So, I interviewed the mayor the other day, and we were talking about the receding of the water. And I said, well, you know, I was hoping we would just pull the plug after it crested, and the bathwater would go out with the baby, but that's not really how that's going to work. No, I talked to, uh, in fact, I had an interview this morning on the radio, and I talked to the Corps this morning, and um, they said, I think the analogy was that the bathtub got filled up with a fire hose, and it's going out a little bit of drain. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it's going to go. It's, uh, you know, the crest is going to happen Thursday, and it's going to stay that way for a while. I think they said it may be a week to 10 days before you actually see a fall, and then it's going to fall very slowly, maybe six, maybe nine inches, somewhere around that range a day from that point. So it's going to take a, a while for it to go down, and uh, it's just going to so be So today we're at... 56.97, we're cresting it. Are we still projecting to crest at 57.5? Well, that's, that's what I heard, 57.5. And Thursday. I'm not going to change off of that, you know, because that's not my okay. expertise. So, so we're, we're running your interview Friday. So I'm assuming that it runs Friday. Then the crest actually will have happened yesterday. Um, but it'll stay at that level four or five days. No, they're saying probably seven, maybe ten days. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it'll be... Um, so how long do you think it'll be before people can actually start getting back into their homes and doing some mitigation? I would say probably anywhere from three to four weeks, maybe. Maybe longer than that. And that's just getting in there to start cleaning up. That's right. Not necessarily is there going to be power or anything like no, that. I, just, I would assume that it won't be That's just power. getting in there and yeah. pulling drywall. Because, and, you know, that's going to be a time frame where people can just maybe, uh, 
just look at it and try to, because I'm going to tell you, I think that is going to be the time where you're going to be fighting snakes and yeah. everything else. Alligators just, and everything you know, else. I mean, what, what do you think the economic impact is going to be for, um, well, I mean, I know that the Mississippi is flooded further north and, well, they've opened the Morganza now, so hopefully that won't affect as many people as it would have, but for the Vicksburg area, what, what do you think the economic impact is? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but... You know, I've heard uh, anywhere from $150 million to 200 and something million. It just all depends if you claim the uh, crops and, you know, farmland and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, it could go on and on and on. It just all depends. I mean, after this water gets out of here, it just, it's going to be huge. I mean, it's just going to be, um, depending upon if you can save structures, if you can, um, if you have to bulldoze them, I mean, it's going to be uh, infrastructure. Um, I, I'm watching them pump water out of our uh, infrastructure system now, down here, off the wall out here. I mean, it's just, I mean, we don't know how much damage it's going to be. I mm -hmm. mean, we got water coming in, you know, all the time now. I'm just pumping it out as fast as, as it's coming in. But, you know, when we look at, and having, having worked some catastrophes myself and was living in the New Orleans area during Katrina, and, you know, what I have seen personally, I worked the, the year of the four hurricanes in South Florida, and I was down there. And what you see initially is great financial hardship. But then, at some point, that kind of turns when recovery starts happening. And then it seems like the community really almost booms because yeah. of all the recovery efforts and the building materials that are needed and the, the individuals who are coming in and they're staying in the hotels and going to eat and spending all this money right. that... I mean, it takes a while to bounce back, but then it seems like it takes us beyond sometimes where that local economy was. Do you, do you see that maybe happening here? I do. Uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of people come here. You're going to have a lot of people uh, helping the community recover. You're going to have a lot of rebuilding. You're gonna, it's going to take a lot of people to, to fix this place. Uh, and like I said, we, d we don't really know uh, what it's going to take to get this place back on on track. I know it's going to take a lot of cleanup. It's going to take a lot. You, we're going to have mud. We're going to have debris. We're going to have uh, goop. structure. I yeah. call it goop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, if you, if I don't know if, uh, if y'all got a chance to see, uh, really, I got some friends of mine that were involved in cleanup down in Katrina. I mean, they had uh, to. Uh, it was like some kind of silt. They had to get up out of there. They had to clean it out. They had to. Uh, filter it and then get it out of there. It was just uh, it was amazing what they had to do. It was uh, a, a huge cleanup effort. But uh, uh, rebuilding, uh, you've got people that'll come here. They'll stay here. They'll eat here. They'll they bring a lot of people here to uh, uh, Vicksburg, and it, it's got a lot. And, and we get a lot of. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you think they're buying gas here? They're yep. going to the convenience stores right. when they do have time for entertainment. They're doing something. That's right. That's they're right. eating and drinking and staying in our hotels That's right. and. That has to help our. Economy. It's going to help this downtown. Yeah. It's going to help our um, historic society. Everything yeah. people will know about Vicksburg after this is over with. They didn't know about Vicksburg before. Right. Um, it has a domino effect. Even though it's affected us negatively, negatively, uh, it'll it'll have a positive effect in another way. And uh, and honestly, some of the things, some of the bad will go, and a lot of good will come out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I told somebody this morning, and I said, you know, the good Lord never puts anything as, as more bad than you can handle. And, uh, you know, I started looking at this cool weather we were having over the last few days. And sometimes we get touched in the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been really hot, hot, hot. Yeah. And that wouldn't have been good. No. Uh, some of these substations that they had to move from one place to another may not have been able to handle the power surge that we would have had in the mm -hmm. hot weather. So we've been relieved in some ways. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, we've just been real fortunate. So I read something the other day that um, said, when you find yourself in the midst of a crisis, stop and, and be thankful for that crisis because that will be the very thing that, make, that gives you the strength you need to press on. Because, right. you know, as bad as things get, they sometimes can get worse. So, you know, so be thankful sometimes. So. 
Well, Alex, I've seen you at lots of meetings around town. You were down at Warrington. You were um, at the airport the other day when the governor came in. I know how busy you are right now, and so I'm very appreciative that you made the time to come and um, sit and chat with me and kind of bring us up to date on your efforts. And um, I appreciate everything you're doing for Vicksburg and really for the state of Mississippi. Thank, Thank you so much for coming and having coffee with us.